A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Book Two, Chapter Six. A Continuation of the Reminiscences of John Watson, M.D. Our prisoner's furious resistance did not apparently indicate any ferocity in his disposition towards ourselves, for on finding himself powerless he smiled in an affable manner, and expressed his hopes that he had not hurt any of us in the scuffle. "'I guess you're going to take me to the police station,' he remarked to Sherlock Holmes. "'My cab's at the door. If you'll loose my legs I'll walk down to it. I'm not so light to lift as I used to be.' Gregson and Lestrade exchanged glances as if they thought this proposition rather a bold one. But Holmes at once took the prisoner at his word, and loosened the towel which we had bound round his ankles. He rose and stretched his legs, as though to assure himself that they were free once more. I remember that I thought to myself as I eyed him that I had seldom seen a more powerfully built man, and his dark, sunburned face bore an expression of determination and energy which was as formidable as his personal strength. "'If there's a vacant place for a chief of the police, I reckon you're the man for it,' he said, gazing with undisguised admiration at my fellow lodger. "'The way you kept on my trail was a caution.' "'You had better come with me,' said Holmes to the two detectives. "'I can drive you,' said Lestrade. "'Good. And Gregson can come inside with me.' "'You too, Doctor. You have taken an interest in the case, and may as well stick to us.' I assented gladly, and we all descended together. Our prisoner made no attempt at escape, but stepped calmly into the cab which had been his, and we followed him. Lestrade mounted the box, whipped up the horse, and brought us in a very short time to our destination. We were ushered into a small chamber, where a police inspector noted down our prisoner's name, and the names of the men with whose murder he had been charged. The official was a white-faced, unemotional man, who went through his duties in a dull, mechanical way. "'The prisoner will be put before the magistrates in the course of the week,' he said. "'In the meantime, Mr. Jefferson, Hope, have you anything that you wish to say? I must warn you that your words will be taken down and may be used against you.' "'I've got a good deal to say,' our prisoner said slowly. "'I want to tell you gentlemen all about it.' "'Hadn't you better reserve that for your trial?' asked the inspector. "'I may never be tried,' he answered. "'You needn't look startled. It isn't suicide I'm thinking of. "'Are you a doctor?' He turned his fierce, dark eyes upon me as he asked this last question. "'Yes, I am.' I answered. "'Then put your hand here,' he said with a smile, motioning with his manacled wrist towards his chest. I did so, and became at once conscious of an extraordinary throbbing and commotion which was going on inside. The walls of his chest seemed to thrill and quiver as a frail building would do inside when some powerful engine was at work. In the silence of the room, I could hear a dull humming and buzzing noise which proceeded from the same source. "'Why?' I cried. "'You have an aortic aneurysm.' "'That's what they call it,' he said placidly. "'I went to a doctor last week about it, and he told me that it is bound to burst before many days passed. It's been getting worse for years. I got it from overexposure and underfeeding among the Salt Lake Mountains. I've done my work now.' and I don't care how soon I go, but I should like to leave some account of the business behind me. I don't want to be remembered as a common cutthroat. The inspector and the two detectives had a hurried discussion as to the advisability of allowing him to tell his story. "'Do you consider, doctor, that there is immediate danger?' the former asked. "'Most certainly there is,' I answered. "'In that case it is clearly our duty, in the interest of justice, "'To take his statement,' said the inspector. "'You are at liberty, sir, to give your account, "'which I again warn you will be taken down.' "'I'll sit down with your leave,' the prisoner said, "'suiting the action to the word. "'This aneurysm of mine makes me easily tired, "'and the tussle we had half an hour ago has not mended matters. "'I'm on the brink of the grave, "'and I'm not likely to lie to you. 
every word i say is the absolute truth and how you use it is a matter of no consequence to me with these words jefferson hope leaned back in his chair and began the following remarkable statement he spoke in a calm and methodical manner as though the events which he narrated were commonplace enough i can vouch for the accuracy of the subjoined accounts for i have had access to lestrade's notebook in which the prisoner's words were taken down exactly as they were uttered it don't much matter to you why i hated these men he said it's enough that they were guilty of the death of two human beings a father and a daughter and that they had therefore forfeited their lives after the lapse of time that has passed since their crime it was impossible for me to secure a conviction against them in any court i knew of their guilt though and i determined that i should be judge jury and executioner all rolled into one you'd have done the same if you have any manhood in you if you had been in my place that girl that i spoke of was to have married me twenty years ago she was forced into marrying that same drebber and broke her heart over it i took the marriage ring from her dead finger and i vowed that his dying eyes should rest upon that very ring and that his last thoughts should be of the crime for which he was punished i have carried about with me and have followed him and his accomplice over two continents until i caught them they thought to tie me out but they could not do it if i die tomorrow as is likely enough i die knowing that my work in this world is done and well done they have perished and by my hand there is nothing left for me to hope for or to desire they were rich and i was poor so that it was no easy matter for me to follow them when i got to london my pocket was about empty and i found that i must turn my hand to something for my living driving and riding are as natural to me as walking so i applied at a cab owner's office and soon got employment i was to bring a certain sum a week to the owner and whatever was over that i might keep for myself there was seldom much over but i managed to scrape along somehow the hardest job was to learn my way about for i reckon that of all the mazes that ever were contrived this city is the most confusing i had a map beside me though and when once i had spotted the principal hotels and stations i got on pretty well it was some time before i found out where my two gentlemen were living but i inquired and inquired until at last i dropped across them they were at a boarding house at camberwell over on the other side of the river when once i found out i knew that i had them at my mercy i had grown my beard and there was no chance of their recognizing me i would dog them and follow them until i saw my opportunity i was determined that they should not escape me again they were very near doing it for all that go where they would about london i was always at their heels sometimes i followed them on my cab and sometimes on foot but the former was the best for then they could not get away from me it was only early in the morning or late at night that i could earn anything so that i began to get behind hand with my employer i did not mind that however as long as i could lay my hand upon the men i wanted they were cunning though they must have thought that there was some chance of their being followed for they would never go out alone and never after nightfall during two weeks i drove behind them every day and never once saw them separate drebber himself was drunk half the time but stangerson was not to be caught napping i watched them late and early but never saw the ghost of a chance but i was not discouraged for something told me that the hour had almost come my only fear was that this thing in my chest might burst a little too soon and leave my work undone at last one evening i was driving up and down torquay terrace as the street was called in which they boarded when i saw a cab drive up to their door presently some luggage was brought out and after a time drebber and stangerson followed it and drove off i whipped up my horse and kept within sight of them feeling very ill at ease for i feared that they were going to be shifting their quarters at euston station they got out 
and I left a boy to hold my horse and follow them onto the platform. I heard them ask for the Liverpool train, and the guard answered that that one had just gone, and there would not be another for some hours. Stangerson seemed to be put out at that, but Drebber was rather pleased than otherwise. I got so close to them in the bustle that I could hear every word that passed between them. Drebber said that he had a little business of his own to do, and that if the other would wait for him, he would soon rejoin him. His companion remonstrated with him, and reminded him that they had resolved to stick together. Drebber answered that the matter was a delicate one, and that he must go alone. I couldn't catch what Stangerson said to that, but the other burst out swearing, and reminded him that he was nothing more than his paid servant, and that he must not presume to dictate to him. On that the secretary gave it up as a bad job, and simply bargained with him that if he missed the last train, he should rejoin him at Halliday's private hotel, to which Drebber answered that he would be back on the platform before eleven, and made his way out of the station. The moment for which I had waited so long had at last come. I had my enemies within my power. Together they could protect each other, but singly they were at my mercy. I did not act, however, with undue precipitation. My plans were already formed. There is no satisfaction in vengeance, unless the offender has time to realize who it is that strikes him, and why retribution has come upon him. I had my plans arranged by which I should have the opportunity of making the man who had wronged me understand that his old sin had found him out. It chanced that some days before a gentleman who had been engaged in looking over some houses in the Brixton Road had dropped the key of one of them in my carriage. It was claimed that same evening, and returned, but in the interval I had taken a moulding of it, and had a duplicate constructed. By means of this I had access to at least one spot in this great city where I could rely upon being free from interruption. How to get Drebber to that house was the difficult problem which I now had to solve. He walked down the road, and went into one or two liquor shops, staying for nearly half an hour in the last of them. When he came out he staggered in his walk, and was evidently pretty well on. There was a hansom just in front of me, and he hailed it. I followed it so close that the nose of my horse was within a yard of his driver the whole way. We rattled across Waterloo Bridge, and through miles of streets, until, to my astonishment, we found ourselves back in the terrace in which he had boarded. I could not imagine what his intention was in returning there, but I went on and pulled up my cab a hundred yards or so from the house. He entered it, and his hansom drove away. "'Give me a glass of water, if you please. My mouth gets dry with the talking.' I handed him the glass, and he drank it down. "'That's better,' he said. "'Well, I waited for a quarter of an hour or more.' when suddenly there came a noise like people struggling inside the house. Next moment the door was flung open and two men appeared, one of whom was Drebber, and the other was a young chap whom I had never seen before. This fellow had Drebber by the collar, and when they came to the head of the steps he gave him a shove and a kick which sent him half across the road. "'You hound!' he cried, shaking his stick at him. I'll teach you to insult an honest girl. He was so hot that I think he should have thrashed Drebber with his cudgel, only that the cur staggered away down the road as fast as his legs could carry him. He ran as far as the corner, and then, seeing my cab, he hailed me and jumped in. Drive me to Holiday's private hotel, said he. When I had him fairly inside my cab, my heart jumped so with joy that I feared lest at this last moment my aneurysm might go wrong. I drove along slowly, weighing in my own mind what it was best to do. I might take him right out into the country, and there in some deserted lane have my last interview with him. I had almost decided upon this when he solved the problem for me. The craze for drink had seized him again and he ordered me to pull up outside a gin palace. He went in, leaving word that I should wait for him. There he remained, 
until closing time, and when he came out he was so far gone that I knew the game was in my own hands. Don't imagine that I intended to kill him in cold blood. It would only have been rigid justice if I had done so, but I could not bring myself to do it. I had long determined that he should have a show of his life if he chose to take advantage of it. Among the many billets which I have filled in America during my wandering life, I was once janitor and sweeper out of the laboratory at York College. One day the professor was lecturing on poisons, and he showed his students some alkaloid, as he called it, which he had extracted from some South American arrow poison, and which was so powerful that the least grain meant instant death. I spotted the bottle in which this preparation was kept, and when they were all gone, I helped myself to a little of it. I was a fairly good dispenser, so I worked this alkaloid into small, soluble pills, and each pill I put in a box with a similar pill made without the poison. I determined at the time that when I had my chance, my gentlemen should each have a draw out of one of these boxes, while I ate the pill that remained. It would be quite as deadly, and a good deal less noisy, than firing across a handkerchief. From that day I had always my pill-boxes about with me, and the time had now come when I was to use them. It was nearer one than twelve, and a wild, bleak night, blowing hard and raining in torrents. Dismal as it was outside, I was glad within, so glad that I could have shouted out from pure exultation. If any of you gentlemen have ever pined for a thing, and longed for it during twenty long years, and then suddenly found it within your reach, you would understand my feelings. I lit a cigar, and puffed at it to steady my nerves. But my hands were trembling, and my temples throbbing with excitement. As I drove, I could see old John Ferrier and sweet Lucy looking at me out of the darkness and smiling at me, just as plain as I see you all in this room. All the way they were ahead of me, one on each side of the horse, until I pulled up at the house in the Brixton Road. There was not a soul to be seen, nor a sound to be heard, except the dripping of the rain. When I looked in at the window, I found Drebber all huddled together in a drunken sleep. I shook him by the arm. "'It's time to get out,' I said. "'All right, cabby,' said he. I suppose he thought we'd come to the hotel that he had mentioned, for he got out without another word, and followed me down the garden. I had to walk beside him to keep him steady, for he was still a little top-heavy. When we came to the door, I opened it, and led him into the front room. I give you my word that all the way the father and the daughter were walking in front of us. "'It's infernally dark,' said he, stamping about. "'We'll soon have a light,' I said, striking a match and putting it to a wax candle which I brought with me. "'Now, Enoch Drebber,' I continued, turning to him and holding the light to my own face. "'Who am I?' He gazed at me with bleared, drunken eyes for a moment, and then I saw a horror springing up in them and convulse his whole features, which showed me that he knew me. He staggered back with a livid face, and I saw the perspiration break out upon his brow, while his teeth chattered in his head. At the sight, I leaned my back against the door, and laughed loud and long. I had always known that vengeance would be sweet, but I had never hoped for the contentment of soul which now possessed me. "'You dog!' I said. I have hunted you from Salt Lake City to St. Petersburg, and you have always escaped me. Now at last your wanderings have come to an end, for either you or I shall never see tomorrow's sunrise. He shrunk still further away as I spoke, and I could see on his face that he thought I was mad. So I was for the time. The pulses in my temples beat like sledgehammers, and I believe I would have had a fit of some sort if the blood had not gushed from my nose and relieved me. "'What do you think of Lucy Ferrier now?' I cried, locking the door and shaking the key in his face. "'Punishment has been slow in coming, but it has overtaken you at last.' 
I saw his coward lips tremble as I spoke. He would have begged for his life, but he knew well that it was useless. W -w "'Would you murder me?' he stammered. "'There is no murder,' I answered. "'Who talks of murdering a mad dog? What mercy had you upon my poor darling when you dragged her from her slaughtered father and bore her away to your accursed and shameless harem?' "'It was not I who killed her father,' he cried. "'But it was you who broke her innocent heart,' I shrieked, thrusting the door before him. "'Let the high God judge between us. Choose and eat. There is death in one and life in the other. I shall take what you leave. Let us see if there is justice upon the earth, or if we are ruled by chance.' He cowered away with wild cries and prayers for mercy, but I drew my knife and held it to his throat until he had obeyed me. Then I swallowed the other, and we stood facing one another in silence for a minute or more, waiting to see which was to live and which was to die. Shall I ever forget the look which came over his face when the first warning pangs told him that the poison was in his system? I laughed as I saw it, and held Lucy's marriage ring in front of his eyes. It was but for a moment, for the action of the alkaloid is rapid. A spasm of pain contorted his features. He threw his hands out in front of him, staggered, and then, with a hoarse cry, fell heavily upon the floor. I turned him over with my foot, and placed my hand upon his heart. There was no movement. He was dead. The blood had been streaming from my nose, but I had taken no notice of it. I don't know what it was that put it into my head to write upon the wall with it. Perhaps it was some mischievous idea of setting the police upon a wrong track, for I felt light-hearted and cheerful. I remembered a German being found in New York with Rache written up above him, and it was argued at the time in the newspapers that the secret societies must have done it. I guessed that what puzzled the New Yorkers would puzzle the Londoners. So I dipped my finger in my own blood and printed it on a convenient place on the wall. Then I walked down to my cab and found that there was nobody about, and that the night was still very wild. I had driven some distance when I put my hand into the pocket in which I usually kept Lucy's ring, and found that it was not there. I was thunderstruck at this for it was the only memento that I had of her. Thinking that I might have dropped it when I stooped over Drebber's body, I drove back, and leaving my cab in a side street, I went boldly up to the house, for I was ready to dare anything, rather than lose the ring. When I arrived there, I walked right into the arms of a police officer who was coming out, and only managed to disarm his suspicions by pretending to be hopelessly drunk. That was how Enoch Drebber came to his end. All I had to do then was to do as much for Stangerson, and so pay off John Ferrier's debt. I knew that he was staying at Halliday's private hotel, and I hung about all day, but he never came out. I fancied that he suspected something when Drebber failed to put in an appearance. He was cunning with Stangerson, and always on his guard. If he thought he could keep me off by staying indoors, he was very much mistaken. I soon found out which was the window of his bedroom, and early next morning I took advantage of some ladders which were lying in the lane behind the hotel, and so made my way into his room in the grey of the dawn. I woke him up and told him that the hour had come when he was to answer for the life he had taken so long before. I described Drebber's death to him, and I gave him the same choice of the poison pills. Instead of grasping at the chance of safety, which that offered him, he sprang from his bed and flew at my throat. In self-defense I stabbed him to the heart. It would have been the same in any case, for Providence would never have allowed his guilty hand to pick out anything but the poison. I have little more to say, and it's as well, for I'm about done up. I went on cabinet for a day or so, intending to keep at it until I could save enough to take me back to America. 
I was standing in the yard when a ragged youngster asked if there was a cabby there called Jefferson Hope, and said that his cab was wanted by a gentleman at 221B Baker Street. I went round, suspecting no harm, and the next thing I knew, this young man here had the bracelets on my wrists, and as neatly snackled as ever I saw in my life. That's the whole of my story, gentlemen. You may consider me to be a murderer, but I hold that I am just as much an officer of justice as you are. So thrilling had the man's narrative been. And his manner was so impressive that we had sat silent and absorbed. Even the professional detectives, blasé as they were in every detail of crime, appeared to be keenly interested in the man's story. When he finished, we sat for some minutes in a stillness which was only broken by the scratching of Lestrade's pencil as he gave the finishing touches to his shorthand account. "'There is only one point on which I should like a little more information,' Sherlock Holmes said at last. "'Who was your accomplice, who came for the ring which I advertised?' The prisoner winked at my friend jocosely. "'I can tell my own secrets.' he said. But I don't get other people into trouble. I saw your advertisement, and I thought it might be a plant, or it might be the ring which I wanted. My friend volunteered to go and see. I think you'll own he did it smartly. Not a doubt of that, said Holmes heartily. Now, gentlemen, the inspector remarked gravely, the forms of the law must be complied with. On Thursday the prisoner will be brought before the magistrates, and your attendance will be required. Until then, I'll be responsible for him. He rang the bell as he spoke, and Jefferson Hope was led off by a couple of warders, while my friend and I made our way out of the station and took a cab back to Baker Street. End of Part 2, Chapter 6 Part 2, Chapter 7 The Conclusion we had all been warned to appear before the magistrates upon the Thursday. But when the Thursday came, there was no occasion for our testimony. A higher judge had taken the matter in hand, and Jefferson Hope had been summoned before a tribunal where strict justice would be meted out to him. On the very night after his capture, the aneurysm burst, and he was found in the morning stretched upon the floor of the cell with a placid smile upon his face as though he had been able in his dying moments to look back upon a useful life and on work well done. "'Gregson and Lestrade will be wild about his death,' Holmes remarked, as we chatted it over next evening. "'Where will their grand advertisement be now?' "'I don't see that they had very much to do with this capture,' I answered. "'What you do in this world is a matter of no consequence.' returned my companion bitterly. The question is, what can you make people believe that you have done? Never mind, he continued more brightly after a pause. I would not have missed the investigation for anything. There has been no better case within my recollection. Simple as it was, there were several most instructive points about it. Simple? I ejaculated. Well, really— it can hardly be described as otherwise, said Sherlock Holmes, smiling at my surprise. The proof of its intrinsic simplicity is that without any help, save a few very ordinary deductions, I was able to lay my hand upon the criminal within three days. That is true, said I. I have already explained to you that what is out of the common is usually a guide rather than a hindrance. In solving a problem of this sort, the grand thing is to be able to reason backwards. That is a very useful accomplishment, and a very easy one, but people do not practice it much. In the everyday affairs of life, it is more useful to reason forwards, and so the other comes to be neglected. There are fifty who can reason synthetically for one who can reason analytically. I confess, said I, that I do not quite follow you. I hardly expected that you would. Let me see if I can make it clearer. Most people, if you describe a train of events to them, will tell you what the result would be. 
they can put those events together in their minds and argue from them that something will come to pass there are few people however who if you told them a result would be able to evolve from their own inner consciousness what the steps were which led up to that result this power is what i mean when i talk of reasoning backwards or analytically i understand said i now this was a case in which you were given the result and had to find everything else for yourself now let me endeavor to show you the different steps in my reasoning to begin at the beginning i approached the house as you know on foot and with my mind entirely free from all impressions i naturally began by examining the roadway and there as i have already explained to you i saw clearly the marks of a cab which i ascertained by inquiry must have been there during the night i satisfied myself that it was a cab and not a private carriage by the narrow gauge of the wheels the ordinary london growler is considerably less wide than a gentleman's brofen this was the first point gained i then walked slowly down the garden path which happened to be composed of a clay soil peculiarly suitable for taking impressions no doubt it appeared to you to be a mere trampled line of slush but to my trained eyes every mark upon its surface had a meaning there is no branch of detective science which is so important and so much neglected as the art of tracing footsteps happily i have always laid great stress upon it and much practice has made it second nature to me i saw the heavy footmarks of the constables but i saw also the track of the two men who had first passed through the garden it was easy to tell that they had been before the others because in places their marks had been entirely obliterated by the others coming upon the top of them in this way my second link was formed which told me that the nocturnal visitors were two in number one remarkable for his height as i calculated from the length of his stride and the other fashionably dressed to judge from the small and elegant impression left by his boots on entering the house this last inference was confirmed my well-booted man lay before me the tall one then had done the murder if murder there was there was no wound upon the dead man's person but the agitated expression upon his face assured me that he had foreseen his fate before it came upon him men who die from heart disease or any sudden natural cause never by any chance exhibit agitation upon their features having sniffed the dead man's lips i detected a slightly sour smell and i came to the conclusion that he had had poison forced upon him again i argued that it had been forced upon him from the hatred and fear expressed upon his face by the method of exclusion i had arrived at this result for no other hypothesis would meet the facts do not imagine that it was a very unheard of idea the forcible administration of poison is by no means a new thing in criminal annals the cases of dolsky in odessa and of Leturier in montpellier will occur at once to any toxicologist and now came the great question as to the reason why robbery had not been the object of the murder for nothing was taken was it politics then or was it a woman that was the question which confronted me i was inclined from the first to the latter supposition political assassins are only too glad to do their work and to fly this murder had on the contrary been done most deliberately and the perpetrator had left his tracks all over the room showing that he had been there all the time it must have been a private wrong and not a political one which called for such a methodical revenge when the inscription was discovered upon the wall i was more inclined than ever to my opinion the thing was too evidently a blind when the ring was found however it settled the question clearly the murderer had used it to remind his victim of some dead or absent woman it was at this point that i asked gregson whether he had inquired in his telegram to cleveland 
as to any particular point in mr drebber's former career he answered you remember in the negative i then proceeded to make a careful examination of the room which confirmed me in my opinion as to the murderer's height and furnished me with the additional details as to the trichinopoly cigar and the length of his nails i had already come to the conclusion since there were no signs of a struggle that the blood which covered the floor had burst from the murderer's nose in his excitement i could perceive that the track of blood coincided with the track of his feet it is seldom that any man unless he is very full-blooded breaks out in this way through emotion so i hazarded the opinion that the criminal was probably a robust and ruddy-faced man events proved that i had judged correctly having left the house i proceeded to do what gregson had neglected i telegraphed to the head of the people at cleveland limiting my inquiry to the circumstances connected with the marriage of enoch drebber the answer was conclusive it told me that drebber had already applied for the protection of the law against an old rival in love named jefferson hope and that this same hope was at present in europe i knew now that i held the clue to the mystery in my hand and all that remained was to secure the murderer i had already determined in my own mind that the man who had walked into the house with drebber was none other than the man who had driven the cab the marks in the road showed me that the horse had wandered on in a way which had been impossible had there been anyone in charge of it where then could the driver be unless he were inside the house again it is absurd to suppose that any sane man would carry out a deliberate crime under the very eyes as it were of a third person who was sure to betray him lastly supposing one man wished to dog another through london what better means could he adopt than to turn cab driver all these considerations led me to the irresistible conclusion that jefferson hope was to be found among the jarvies of the metropolis if he had been one there was no reason to believe that he had ceased to be on the contrary from his point of view any sudden change would be likely to draw attention to himself he would probably for a time at least continue to perform his duties there was no reason to suppose that he was going under an assumed name why should he change his name in a country where no one knew his original one i therefore organized my street arab detective corps and sent them systematically to every cab proprietor in london until they ferreted out the man that i wanted how well they succeeded and how quickly i took advantage of it are still fresh in your recollection the murder of stangerson was an incident which was entirely unexpected but which could hardly in any case have been prevented through it as you know i came into possession of the pills the existence of which i had already surmised you see the whole thing is a chain of logical sequences without a break or flaw it is wonderful i cried your merits should be publicly recognized you should publish an account of the case if you won't i will for you you may do what you like doctor he answered see here he continued handing a paper over to me look at this it was the echo for the day and the paragraph to which he pointed was devoted to the case in question the public it said have lost a sensational treat through the sudden death of the man hope who was suspected of the murder of mr enoch drebber and of mr joseph stangerson the details of the case will probably be never known now though we are informed upon good authority that the crime was the result of an old standing and romantic feud in which love and mormonism bore a part it seems that both the victims belonged in their younger days to the latter-day saints and hope the deceased prisoner hails also from salt lake city if the case had had no other effect it at least brings out in the most striking manner the efficiency of our detective police force and will serve as a lesson to all foreigners that they will do wisely to settle their feuds at home and not to carry them on to british soil it is an open secret that the credit of this smart capture belongs entirely to the well-known scotland yard officials messrs lestrade and gregson 
the man was apprehended it appears in the rooms of a certain mr sherlock holmes who has himself as an amateur shown some talent in the detective line and who with such instructors may hope in time to attain to some degree of their skill it is expected that a testimonial of some sort will be presented to the two officers as a fitting recognition of their services didn't i tell you so when we started cried sherlock holmes with a laugh that's the result of all our study in scarlet to get them a testimonial never mind i answered i have all the facts in my journal and the public shall know them in the meantime you must make yourself contented by the consciousness of success like the roman miser populus me sibilat et mihi plaudo ipse domi simul ac numos contemplor in arca end of book two chapter seven the end of a study in scarlet by sir arthur conan doyle